I actually don't believe in the industry plan because it's actually impossible to make somebody genuinely successful mm-hmm. like and it be fake. I agree. You can you can get famous and it can be fake, but you can't actually have people love you and like cherish you and have art that's really good. <laughs> All over social media, we see posts and videos calling music's next big thing an industry plant. Typically, it's said in a negative way and with the implication that the person's rise to fame is questionable, if not suspicious. But what exactly is an industry plant? Do they even exist at all? To try and answer this question, I want to take a look at artists who are widely considered industry plants and see if they truly fit that description. Just as a small disclaimer, I don't by any means consider all of the artists that I'm going to talk about to be industry plants. But it's still important to take a look at an artist when their name comes up several times, since that probably means there's a glaring reason people consider them to be an industry plant. Since it's such a hot topic in music though, I wanted to break it down and see if we can finally pin down what makes an artist an industry plant, or if that's even a term we can fairly apply to artists at all. So let's go ahead and get into it. The term industry plant originated on hip hop message boards. The first uses of the term were in a forum called Kanye to the from 2012. The thread had multiple messages regarding rappers alleged to be industry plants, including Lil Wayne and 50 Cent. Many on the thread said that the aforementioned rappers were plants because their labels heavily pushed them on social media, advertisements, and other means of public consumption. Just a quick scroll through the thread shows heavy disagreement on what it means to call someone an industry plant. There seems to be two different definitions that are now the most widely accepted. The first is that an industry plant is anyone that a record label heavily promotes through means like social media, memes, advertisements, brand deals, and more. The other definition is that an industry plant is one who lies about being a self-made artist when in fact they've had the backing of a label the entire time. Though both definitions are distinct, I think the differing opinions on what makes an industry plant have been caused by a shift in celebrity culture and the fact that the way we interact with celebrities has changed. Arguably, there have been eras where both of these definitions of an industry plant could potentially be valid. Usually, in calling an artist an industry plant, there's an implication that they're less talented and therefore less deserving of their career. I don't find this true, and I think it's important to separate how someone got their career from the question of their talent. Benefiting from favoritism or nepotism doesn't automatically make someone untalented. In addition, just because an artist is an industry plant, that doesn't mean that they don't work hard. True, they may not have had to work hard to obtain stardom, but that doesn't mean that the artist isn't working hard to put out quality music and give their best performances. As the term suggests, an industry plant is one that has propped up to be a star from the very beginning. They've been plucked up and planted right in the perfect position to succeed. Not all industry plants are plucked out of obscurity, but all of them are put at an advantage to succeed in the industry over the majority of their peers. The industry plant has the best producers, PR team, and all of the resources the label has to offer in order to support their success. The industry plant is an expensive investment of the label, and they're going to do everything in their power to ensure that it pays off. Over time, record labels have changed some of the ways that they show their affiliation with an artist, if they show it at all. I think social media has really changed this and contributed to the differing ideas of what an industry plant is. Prior to social media, the industry plant was typically an artist that was snatched up from humble beginnings, given an extreme makeover, and molded into the ideal pop star. In a lot of cases, the artist was already working in the industry in some capacity, but the label expedites their rise to stardom and rolls them out quickly. The industry plant is a product from start to finish and is manufactured to sell a fantasy that will in turn sell records. These artists are always looked at as the ideal versions of ourselves and have the perfect bodies, mansions, and lifestyles. An integral part of the artist's success at the time was their public visibility. Without social media, labels had to ensure artists and their music were extremely accessible since fans couldn't just get on the internet and seek it out for themselves. That's why we saw these artists all over the tabloids, constantly touring, and promoting frequently on music shows. Part of this promotion usually includes being on the best red carpets and performing at prestigious events, typically before a point in their career that would warrant such privileges. The industry plant will be seen alongside some of the biggest names in the music industry when it seems that they were a nobody just a short while ago. In the pre-social media era, people rarely heard of artists before they were signed to a record label. Seeing an unknown artist next to a prolific label exec or fellow artist gives the impression that their career is legitimate and influences us to accept them quicker than we might have otherwise. Some alleged industry plants from the 90s and early 2000s include Britney Spears, NSYNC, and Mariah Carey. 
Mariah Carey's signing to Columbia Records was reportedly done with the intention of making her arrival for Whitney Houston and Madonna. Of course, Mariah is one of the best vocalists of all time, but Columbia definitely gave her the much needed push to make her into a star. When she was discovered, Mariah had been working as a backup singer. At the end of 1988, her demo tape fell into the hands of Tommy Mottola, the CEO of Columbia's parent company, Sony. After hearing her demo, he spent weeks trying to track Mariah down because he was enamored with her voice and saw her potential to be an asset to the label. After signing to Columbia, Mariah became one of their biggest priorities and she was given the top producers to work with. Columbia gave Mariah a million dollar budget for her self-titled debut album, something that's basically unheard of for a new artist. Yet, since Columbia was so eager to have her compete with Madonna and Whitney, her career was launched and promoted at the highest level possible. In 1990, the same year Mariah debuted, she sang America the Beautiful at the NBA Finals and her debut album topped the charts for 11 weeks. Mariah won two Grammys in 1991, one for Best New Artist and the other for Best Female Pop Vocal Performance. In 1991 alone, she sold over 15 million records and Mariah Carey, the album, has gone nine times platinum. With the release of Emotions, Mariah became the first artist to have their first five singles all go number one. Unfortunately, promotions for emotions contributed to the speculation that Mariah was an industry plant, though this wasn't the term that was used at the time. Mariah faced criticism for her live performances and was accused of not having the vocal range that she was marketed to have. The fact that she didn't tour to promote emotions only added to the speculation. Luckily, Mariah shut down the rumors with a performance on MTV's Unplugged. During the live performance, she showcased her vocal prowess, performing her own songs as well as covers. It ended speculation that she couldn't sing live and cemented her status as one of music's best vocalists. Mariah Carey's career inadvertently helped the career of another artist widely regarded as being an industry plant. Between 1993 and 1998, Mariah Carey and Tommy Mottola were married. The marriage was tumultuous and Tommy Mottola was said to be controlling of both Mariah's life and career. Though she was 24 when they married, she was only 18 when she met Mottola while he was 38. Mariah has since come out so that the marriage was manufactured as part of her image and it was a miserable time in her life. Matola, on the other hand, admitted to being obsessive and controlling, but he claimed that it fortunately resulted in Mariah's success. Despite their divorce, Mariah would still have to work with Tommy due to her contract with Sony. She expressed her desire to terminate the contract and was eventually free despite still owing Sony another album. In 2001, Mariah signed a $100 million deal with Virgin Records, it being one of the biggest record deals at the time. To punish her for leaving both Sony and their marriage, Matola allegedly set out to sabotage Mariah's career. This meant creating an artist to rival Mariah's fame and popularity, even if she couldn't rival her vocal talent. Jennifer Lopez had been in the industry for a while at this point, first as a fly girl, then as an actress. Her star-making role as Selena inspired her to pursue a career in music. Her debut album, On the Six, was released in 1999. Producers on the album included Dark Child and her then-boyfriend, P. Diddy. Three of the singles charted on the Hot 100, and If You Have My Love went number one. So Jayla was already clearly doing well for herself, but Tommy would ensure that she did even better, if just to spite Mariah. By the time she was set to work on her sophomore album, Jayla had already been recruited by Matola. While Mariah was working on her next single, Lover Boy, she selected the song Firecracker by Yellow Magic Orchestra to sample. Matola and Sony noticed this and acquired the same sample to create a song for JLo. Firecracker was by no means a hot sample at the time, so it was clearly selected just to sabotage Mariah. Columbia used the sample for JLo's song, I'm Real. A murder remix of I'm Real was also released, which featured Ja Rule. Though it's called a remix, the song has different lyrics and production, so you can't hear the Firecracker sample in this one. However, having Ja Rule on the song was yet another shot at Mariah. Mariah said that she'd planned to release a collaboration with him too. The sabotage was confirmed by Irv Gotti, a producer and the co-founder of Murder, Inc. Records. He said, Tommy Mottola called me because he found out that me and Ja Rule cut a record with Mariah Carey, and at the time he hated Mariah Carey, so he was pumping Jennifer Lopez to compete. According to Irv, Matola also said to him, I need you to make a record with J-Lo, but I want you to put Ja Rule on it and make it a duet kind of record. The I'm Real Murder remix went number one on September 8th of 2001. The release of the original version of I'm Real forced Mariah to rework Loverboy and change the sample. It was released as the lead single for her album Glitter, and it was the first of her lead singles to not go number one. Mariah has since said in an interview with Andy Cohen that the situation was so bad and so stressful that it nearly ended her life. 
Glitter was released three days after the I'm Real remix first went number one. Unfortunately, this day was September 11, 2001. This of course meant that no one's attention was on Mariah's album, which obviously hurt sales. Due to Mariah struggling with her mental health for obvious reasons and the failure of Glitter, both the album and the movie, Virgin Records cut ties with Mariah. I just can't imagine how evil and petty someone has to be to basically give someone else a career just for the sake of revenge. This was to JLo's benefit though because she was treated as one of Columbia's high profile artists and her career grew even more because of it. When it comes to her time with Columbia, JLo was obviously created by Tommy as a weapon to destroy Mariah. It seems that social media has changed the way that we view industry plants. I think social media is responsible for the prevalence of the second definition of what an industry plant is. This is an artist who purposely lies about their connections. Rolling Stone defines an industry plant similarly, saying that it's an artist who has label backing but lies about being self-made. Often, these self-made images are crafted and disseminated on social media. Artists use social media as a means of promoting their music and give fans a behind-the-scenes access to their journey to fame. Labels often do this to push an artist in a way that seems more organic, hoping it will lead to a viral moment. This makes it seem like the artist purely got famous from their talent and the support of their fans. However, the label has cheated this moment by giving their artists a leg up and creating the sort of music and image that would go viral in the first place. These fake social media posts are part of a narrative that the artist and label are crafting, that you're watching their journey in real time when in reality, you're purposely kept a few steps behind. Labels know that there's a certain distaste for artists who appear too label-backed, and audiences prefer seeing a quote-unquote regular person rise to fame. Since thanks to social media were now part of the artist's journey to stardom, they want to make it look as real as possible. Fans who see artists as regular people tend to believe they're earning their careers for their talent rather than their looks or nepotism. This type of industry plan has only become more common as internet and pop culture have shifted to preferring their stars to be more relatable and that they present a more attainable lifestyle. With these new age industry plans, they're usually introduced to us in the context of being an undiscovered musician. This differs from a lot of the pre-social media industry plants, who had often already been working in the industry before becoming their record label's latest project, if they were discovered at all. People like J.Lo, Justin Timberlake, and Christina Aguilera had all broken into the industry to some degree prior to being launched into superstardom. For the first time, we're able to see many artists prior to them being signed to a record label, or at least we get to see artists that present that way. A lot of the time, these social media industry plants make it seem as if one day they were just making music in their bedroom and then the next they're nominated for a Grammy or headlining Coachella. Yes, the bedroom posts might truly be them working on their music, but the artists often neglect to mention that they already have a recording contract or know someone in the industry. Different from industry plants prior to social media, these new industry plants keep their connections private rather than use them as a means to legitimize their career. A well-known example of this is Madison Beer. Initially, her discovery was portrayed as Justin Bieber finding her YouTube videos by pure happenstance. He liked the video so much that he tweeted it, making 13-year-old Madison an internet sensation. She was then put in contact with Justin's manager, Scooter Braun. Many questioned why Justin and his team felt so especially moved by Madison's vocals, which didn't seem like anything too extraordinary. The truth, however, was that Madison's mother had been friends with Scooter long before Justin found the video. It's surely no coincidence that an artist managed by her old friend is the one who found the video, or that just a few days after Justin shared the video, Madison was signed to the same label as him. Madison, of course, was attacked once the truth was exposed. Even if she was a willing participant in this, she was still a child, and truly no child would say no to this, so she's not to blame. It is understandable, though, that fans would feel angry over being lied to. A false story had been orchestrated, and it seemed like an attempt to manipulate fans' feelings. Instead of coming off as a nice to play of support on Justin Bieber's part, it now came off as the label's attempt to capitalize on Justin's fan base to ensure Madison was also a profitable success. Claro is another artist widely considered to be an industry plant. Even if you've never heard of her, you've probably heard at least one of her songs. Claro, born Claire Cottrell, rose to internet fame after her song Pretty Girl went viral in 2017. She's one of the biggest bedroom pop artists, a genre that gets its name from artists making electronic music in their bedrooms. These artists are usually in their teens or early 20s and post their music to the internet as it's usually the only form of promotion that they can afford. The very definition of bedroom pop is that the music is homemade and free of the fine tuning and overproducing that comes with making music in a studio. 
Because of this, bedroom pop usually has a dreamy, hazy feel to it. The point of bedroom pop is very much to be a regular person in their room making art, or to at least come off as if this is the case. Clara had been posting her music on YouTube well before Pretty Girl blew up, but when it went viral, she quickly became one of the faces of bedroom pop and Gen Z's internet musicians in general. Just a year after the success of Pretty Girl, Clara performed at Lollapalooza and opened for Dua Lipa on tour. TikTok helped Clara's career explode even more, with her songs trending regularly on the app in 2019 and 2020. At first glance, it just seems like the YouTube algorithm was in Clara's favor. However, Reddit sleuths uncover that her father, Jeff Cottrell, is an executive at Rubber Tracks, which is the record label that Clara was signed to. The internet obviously realized that her father was likely the reason for her popularity. He also has an extensive marketing background, having previously worked with Coca-Cola, Starbucks, and Converse, where he was the chief marketing officer. So not only did Clara have a connection in the music industry, her connection is also well experienced with marketing. In retrospect, fans said that Pretty Girl was too good and too catchy of a song for Clara to have made on her own without the help of a producer. They called Clara out for being dishonest about her industry connections and she was branded as an industry plant. Singer King Princess has a relatively similar origin story to Clara. Though she was marketed as just a girl in her guitar, she comes from a well-known family. Her actual name is Michaela Strauss and she's the twice great-granddaughter of Isidore Strauss. Isidore Strauss was a congressman and was also the co-owner of Macy's. Both Isidore and his wife Ida Strauss died on the Titanic. This couple in the movie is actually a reference to them. It is worth it to mention that King Princess has said that she's not an heiress and that she didn't inherit any of the Macy's fortune. Regardless, you can't buy that sort of family legacy and I'm sure that it's helped your career. And even if that's considered too far of a connection to benefit from, her father owns a recording studio in New York. King Princess has said this in interviews and has been open about having more or less grown up in the music industry. This exposure taught her a lot about how record labels operate and it inspired her to study music before she became an artist. So to me, despite what a lot of people have said, I don't really think of King Princess as an industry plant. She's been pretty open about her background, though she definitely didn't lead with it. I just think she's someone who benefits heavily from nepotism, which I also think is the case for Claro. I can see the difference though that it seems more like Claro kept her connections more hidden and King Princess was honest about them when she was asked. Billie Eilish is also widely considered to be an industry plant. She's similar to a Lord type figure in that she was a young, moody teenager who became a social media icon for a subset of young fans. If Billie had been around in Tumblr's heyday, she definitely would have fit in perfectly with the sad girl aesthetic that was consisting of images of Lana Del Rey, the Arctic Monkeys, and that one looking for Alaska quote that talks about smoking. Billie came onto the scene when she gained attention for her song Ocean Eyes in 2015. It blew up on SoundCloud and her brother Phineas was encouraged by his manager to help develop Billie's career. Though she was only 13, her melancholy voice and sad girl vibes were just what many a brooding internet teen wanted. In 2016, Phineas's manager arranged a deal for Billie with Apple Music and they signed her to their A&R company, Platoon. The label shot a new music video for Ocean Eyes and released it on Billie's YouTube channel. Billie was also signed to Interscope in 2016. The fact that she was signed to such a big label with such few songs out definitely raised eyebrows. Interscope's plan for Billie was to market her so that fans would associate her with a certain vibe and aesthetic rather than a particular song. Because of this, Billie's style and persona is as big a part of her brand as her music. Her baggy, boyish clothes give off the vibe of her being effortlessly cool. But the matching sets, jewelry, and nails are a reminder that her look is carefully curated and meant to appeal to her teen audience. Billie's publicist is actually the one who got her connected with Chanel. I think these connections coming so early in her career, as well as Billie's super manufactured look, started the suspicions that she was an industry plant. Her music being a perfect interpretation of Gen Z's sad girl music and the fact that it was suddenly everywhere only fueled these industry plant accusations. Her EPs received multiple remix albums, two of her songs were featured in 13 Reasons Why, and she secured a successful collaboration with Khalid all within about a year. Billie was in publications like Forbes and Vanity Fair and became the youngest person to have a song reach a billion streams on Spotify. In 2019, the idea of Billie being an industry plant took on a life of its own when it was discovered that her parents were actors. Things only got worse after Phineas posted a now-deleted tweet that many felt had get your ass up and work energy. The tweet read, a piece of advice to young creatives. Shooting your shot is promoted widely and I think honestly, it's a little overrated. Work super hard alone or with your closest friends. Make shit so good it speaks for itself. Don't pester people to work with you, let them come to you. 
People claim that the only reason that Billy and Phineas didn't have to shoot their shot was because they had access to their parents' connections. Phineas defended himself by saying his parents were never big enough actors to make a living from it, and they had no connections to the music industry before Phineas and his band were signed. He was on Glee though, so maybe his family connections got him that? Who knows? While I don't think Billy's parents have the same amount of power as a record label exec or an A-list actor, I find it hard to believe that their parents' connections didn't help Billy and Phineas, if even in a small way. I think a lot of people assume Billy is an industry plant because of the huge influence she's had on the sound of teen pop music. Many theorized her label was looking for a vessel to shift pop music in a new direction, and they chose Billy. This strategy would only work if audiences like the music, which is always a gamble. Even when two songs sound similar, often one is a hit and the other is a miss. There's not always a tried and true formula to what audiences enjoy. I think it's more likely that rather than trying to shift music in a predetermined direction, they took Billy's persona and sound and polished it and just marketed the hell out of her. I think it's much easier to make music so popular that it becomes influential than it is to create music that's influential purely on its own merit. For example, I could design the coolest shirt in the world, but if Kim Kardashian puts on a black t-shirt, best believe that t-shirt is going to outsell me easily. Not because it's inherently better or more creative, but because of its association with a person deemed fashionable and influential. I think something similar was done with Billy. If Billy is styled as the cool girl who's always ahead of the game, we're going to view whatever music she puts out as cool and influential and worth listening to. I think the most disastrous example of the whole industry plant thing backfiring has to be the Tramp Stamps. Grayson's Projects has a great deep dive video on them, and I'll link it below if you want to watch it and learn more. In late 2020, a trio of rainbow-haired girls and their man-hating music hit the internet. They were dressed in what's now called TikTok fashion, which is currently heavily Y2K influenced. The Tramp Stamps also have a clear e-girl influence, which is another aesthetic that's extremely popular with younger girls on TikTok. Their look communicated very loudly exactly which demographic that they were trying to appeal to. Their pop punk sound was a clear attempt to ride the Olivia Rodrigo wave. The Tramp Stamps uploaded covers of Weezer and Blink-182 songs, which I'm sure was somehow meant to make them look more legit just because they were paying homage to the music that they were imitating. Their song, 1-800-Miss-Your-Guts, actually samples Blink-182's What's My Age Again. Fun fact, Bottom Bitch by Doja Cat also samples this song. The Tramp Stamps version of their origin story was that they got drunk at a bar and wrote their first song together. Their song lyrics, of course, talked about how useless and disappointing men are. Even before the Tramp Stamps were accused of being industry plants, it was extremely evident that they were trying hard to capitalize off of TikTok trends. Their song, The Legend of Jennifer, is a direct reference to Jennifer's Body, a movie that's finally being recognized as a feminist masterpiece, large part in thanks to discourse on TikTok. Honestly, their music has the same vibe as an Amy Schumer stand-up special, but just with drums and electric guitar. If you think I'm just being mean, the Tramp Stamps apparently have their own label called Make Tampons Free. A Vox article described their style as Riot Girl meets Mean Girls, and I can see that description. The Tramp Stamps actually had a decent-sized following on TikTok initially, and their songs have millions of listens on Spotify. Their music sounds exactly like the type of music that their target demographic would eat up. And they did, until the Tramp Stamps caused scandal with a snippet from their song, I'd Rather Die. The most questioned lyrics of the song were, I'd rather die than hook up with a straight white guy. These lyrics weren't received well, coming from the likes of three white women. The lyrics came off as inauthentic and were considered offensive by some. They were called fetishizing, attention-seeking, and like an attempt by the Tramp Stamps to seem spicy straight. The backlash was fueled by the fact that one of the members appears to be in a relationship with a cis white man. To be fair, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's straight, but it does mean that he's white. One of the band members, though, identifies as gay. The internet begged the Tramp Stamps not to release the full song, as they felt that the group was exploiting both queer and punk aesthetics. They released the song anyway, which only increased backlash and caused fans to search for dirt on the girls that they could use for retaliation. I feel like a lot of the time, people don't even bother to look deeper into an artist's past until the artist does something to offend them. Like, I feel like anytime something major gets exposed about an artist, it's because a disgruntled stan got to digging. As fans looked further into the Tramp Stamps, they found that things weren't adding up. Despite being a relatively new girl group, they had a pristine website and Instagram page. It seemed too polished for girls who just met by chance at a bar like they said they did. Instead, it seemed like the pages had been perfectly curated and the website was on standby for use as soon as the girls blew up. The Tramp Stamps shared their music on TikTok and participated in trends to help grow their fan base. 
It was also uncovered that the lead singer Marissa and the guitarist Caroline had contracts with Prescription Songs, a music publishing house owned by Dr. Luke. This dashed their credibility further and made many people feel that their woman empowerment lyrics were meaningless. All three of the members had solo careers prior to their random bar encounter, which was now sounding more and more fabricated. The backlash was so severe that the tramp stamps disabled their social media accounts and only returned days later to call the dirt on them misinformation and lies. They said that they were, in fact, independent artists because Make Tampons Free was an independent label. They neglected to mention that Make Tampons Free is under a company called Artists Without a Label and that company is owned by Cobalt Music Group, which is one of the world's biggest music publishing companies. As you can imagine, the tramp stamps are now just viewed as little more than an internet joke at best and problematic and canceled at worst. I think their overly manufactured persona was definitely their downfall. Their brand comes off as what an older person thinks a teen girl wants to see and hear. Their style looks just like a caricature of a teen girl. Over committing to this man-hating, alternative, and queer-coded aesthetic was definitely to their detriment, and they probably would have gone under their radar had they just toned it down a little bit. Their music was little more than industry-approved white girl boss feminism with a pop-punk spin on it, and trying to paint it as otherwise, despite valid criticism, didn't sit well with audiences. And when you upset the internet, there's really nowhere to hide and nothing is sacred. The tram stamps have gotten more attention for being alleged industry plants than they ever did for their music and it looks like their TikTok account has now been deleted. Whether industry plans even exist at all is also widely debated. After all, it's a record label's job to promote their artists. Also, not knowing every single hardship an artist faced prior to fame doesn't mean that they were handed their careers on a silver platter. More importantly, not seeing the hype around a certain artist or personally feeling that they grew too fast doesn't make them an industry plant. Noah Callahan Beaver, who's the former COO at Complex and a former executive VP at Def Jam, said that he doesn't believe industry plans exist at all. He says, quote, People get suspicious when an artist is on their radar more than that person feels that they deserve to be. He also said that a lot of the time an artist's popularity just comes down to proper marketing. Honestly, I agree with him. Good marketing doesn't make an artist an industry plant, and there's no such thing as marketing too much when it comes to pushing someone. I think people are also very biased in their ability to judge how big an artist is or should be. Oftentimes, artists grow strong internet fan bases that increase at a realistic pace. It takes them years to break into the mainstream, but there are still multiple people who have followed their career before then. A good example of this is Doja Cat. She started making music online around 10 years ago. She grew a loyal fan base on SoundCloud and then started playing small venues after getting her first record deal in 2014. This is around when I first heard of Doja Cat because she featured on a song that I like. She was still doing these small venue shows for years after. Doja had viral moments in between, but her career finally took off in around 2019. When she was suddenly everywhere, people tried to call her an industry plant, and she was seen as an artist who just sprung up out of nowhere. It doesn't take an industry plant seven years to have their breakout moment. The label expedites their rise to fame, and typically their fan base is growing exponentially from nearly the moment that they hit the internet. But when we don't know an artist has an extensive resume, it's easy to believe the label's just favoring them and giving them a big push before they earned it. There's also multiple cases of artists being extremely popular in their hometown, and that local popularity then shoots them to stardom. A great example I can think of from the pre-internet era is Selena Quintanilla. Though she'd been in the music industry the majority of her life, Selena was most popular in the Tejano market. She had a strong Hispanic fan base and was well known in places like Texas, Mexico, and California, but she was mostly unknown to the general American public. Had Selena been able to cross over into the English market, she would have come off to the general public as a new breakout artist. In reality, Selena had won a Grammy, multiple Tejano music awards, had a clothing line, and was sponsored by Coca-Cola, having achieved all of this before even beginning her crossover album. It was Selena's untimely death that has since expanded her fame into the American mainstream. Though it should have been her music that accomplished this, and definitely would have been had she lived, Selena is a great example as to how relative fame is. It puts things into perspective when it comes to artists that we perceive as coming out of nowhere and therefore accused of being industry plants. At the end of the day, someone being considered an industry plant seems to come down to a couple factors. One of those factors is how honest they are about the amount of support they received and how the label handled their rollout. Still, this is a tricky label to slap on people sometimes because like I mentioned earlier, it's a label's job to promote an artist and it's completely subjective how authentic and deserved this promotion is. 
I do, of course, still think it's wrong for artists to be deceptive about how their career started or the connections that they had access to. I think to take this further and distinguish a quote-unquote industry plant from a just plain liar, it seems the label encourages these artists in these cases to lie about their background. They work with the artist to craft an image of being a regular person because they know that that will appeal to the masses better. Speaking of which, I do feel like we as a public perpetuate the existence of so-called industry plants because we discredit people's talent from the moment we learn about their industry connections. I'm not excusing that these artists and labels are lying, but if an environment is created in which they have to lie for their artists to succeed, they're definitely going to lie. I'm not saying that any of us are as powerful or influential as a label, but I think if we have any responsibility in this, it's that we as fans get rid of the idea that industry connections inherently make an artist less talented or less deserving. Let's be real, we only use the term industry plant for artists that we don't like or don't respect. I also noticed that the term industry plant is overwhelmingly applied to women. I even mostly talked about women in this video and it wasn't necessarily on purpose, but because the artists who are mostly considered industry plants are women. I think it's because we can also use the idea of industry plants to fit the narrative that women often don't deserve their record deals or that there's no way they could create quality music without the help of a label. Female artists are taken less seriously, yet simultaneously are held to a higher standard, and so their music is less often seen as good enough to earn a music career through pure merit. At first, I thought maybe it was a coincidence or an oversight that I was only talking about women, but I found other articles confirming my belief that women are overwhelmingly and often unfairly called industry plants. I've got to be honest and say that I'm still on the fence about the whole idea of industry plants. I completely get the idea of them and why people think certain artists fit in those categories. But to me, it's still too hard to define and there's so much gray area. I feel like in a way, all artists that labels promote are industry plants and it's sort of the point of promoting. Labels are supposed to use their resources to make an artist as big as possible. Like I said before, I think it's also hard to pin down who is and isn't an industry plant because a lot of the time that's relative depending on how relevant or talented we think an artist is. The only way I could see the argument for industry plants existing is if that definition is exclusive to when artists and labels conspire together to make an artist seem self-made. I think this is because it's an orchestrated lie about the artist's career, and this lie is told to capitalize on fans' willingness to relate to an artist. The artist is purposely pretending to be something that they're not. I know the same can be said about Britney Spears or any other of the mega pop stars. But to me, the difference is that most of us know the pop star life with the perfect hair and the outfits and the over-the-top stage sets as make-believe, or at least not everyday life. We can separate that fiction from reality and can more consciously decide if that's a fantasy that we want to give into when we support an artist. But when an artist is in their childhood bedroom, filming on a cracked iPhone and wearing an old sweater, that lie is hard to spot because it looks like more reality than fantasy for most of us we aren't given the same opportunity to opt out of the illusion that they've constructed. Labels know this and know that it translates to money, and so they purposely employ this tactic. A lot of these people I wouldn't call industry plants, but just secret nepotism babies. I feel like that's the only distinction that is black or white here. An artist either is or isn't a nepotism baby. But like I said, when it comes to them being an industry plant, the label is supposed to promote them. Yes, when an artist is dishonest about those connections, they should be held accountable, but I think it's easier and more accurate to just call them a liar. I do appreciate, though, that this whole discourse on industry plants has started a conversation about artists being intentionally dishonest about their connections because I do think it's very important that that's talked about. Before I end the video, I wanted to include a couple of other artists who have been called industry plants and want to know what you think about them and whether you agree, so comment below and let me know what you think. If you like this video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. This was a long one, it was a difficult one, but I definitely enjoyed challenging myself and my thoughts and putting this video out for you guys. And this is one where I really, really wanna hear your thoughts, so do not be shy in the comments, you guys never are. But just a reminder, I will see you guys very soon in my next one, and thank you so much for watching. As always, love you guys very much, Bye bye